Hi there! This is Chris Stalky, and this is Storytime with Chris. Um, so, if you are joining me for the first time, I have been going through book one of C.S. Lewis's uh, The Chronicles of Narnia books, which happens to be The Magician's Nephew. And I've been reading this book in three chapter chunks. And this evening, we are about to read chapters 10 through 12. And in my opinion, this is probably the best part of the book, but that's just me. Uh, very exciting, and there's lots of fun things that are going to happen in these three chapters. So I hope you enjoy as uh, we explore chapters 10, 11, and 12 of The Magician's Nephew by C.S. Lewis. Chapter 10, The First Joke and other matters. It was, of course, the lion's voice. The children had long felt sure that he could speak, yet it was a lovely and terrible shock when he did. Out of the trees, wild people stepped forth, gods and goddesses of the wood. With them came fawns and satyrs and dwarves. Out of the river rose the river god with his naiad daughters, and all these and all the beasts and birds in their different voices, low or high or thick or clear, replied, Hail, Aslan, we hear and obey. We are awake, we love, we think, we speak, we know. But please, we don't know very much yet, said a nosy and snorty kind of voice, and that really did make the children jump, for it was the cab horse who had spoken. Good old Strawberry, said Polly. I am glad he was one of the ones picked out to be a talking beast. And the cabbie, who was now standing beside the children, said, Strike me pink. I always did say that horse had a lot of sense, though. Creatures, I give you yourselves, said the strong, happy voice of Aslan. I give to you forever this land of Narnia. I give you the woods, the fruits, the rivers. I give you the stars, and I give you myself. The dumb beasts whom I have not chosen are yours also. Treat them gently and cherish them, but do not go back to their ways, lest you cease to be talking beasts. For out of them you were taken, and into them you can return. Do not so. No, Aslan, we won't, we won't, said everyone. But one perky jackdaw added in a loud voice, No fear! And everyone else had finished just before he said it, so that his words came out quite clear in a dead silence. And perhaps you have found out how awful that can be, say, at a party. The jackdaw became so embarrassed that it hit its wing, or sorry, hit its head under its wing as if it was going to sleep. And all the other animals began making various queer noises, which are their way of laughing, and which, of course, no one has ever heard in our world. They tried at first to repress it, but Aslan said, Laugh and fear not, creatures. Now that you are no longer dumb and witless, you need not always be grave. For jokes as well as justice come in with speech. So they all let themselves go, and there was such merriment that the Jokta himself plucked up courage again and perched on the cab horse's head between its ears, clapping its wings and said, Aslan, Aslan, have I made the first joke? Will everybody always be told how I made the first joke? No, little friend, said the lion. You have not made the first joke. You have only been the first joke. Then everyone laughed more than ever. But the jackdaw didn't mind and laughed just as loud till the horse shook its head and the jackdaw lost its balance and fell off. But remembered its wings. They were still new to it before it reached the ground. And now, said Aslan, Narnia is established. We must next take thought for keeping it safe. I will call some of you to my council. Come hither to me, you the chief dwarf, and you the river god, and you oak, and the he-owl, and both the ravens and the bull elephant. We must talk together, for though the world is not five hours old, an evil has already entered it. The creatures he had named came forward, and he turned away eastward with them. The others all began talking, saying things like, What did he say had entered the world? A evil? What's a evil? No, he didn't say a evil. he said a weevil. Well, what's that? 
Look here, said Diggory to Polly. I've got to go after him. Aslan, I mean, the lion. I must speak to him. Do you think we can, said Polly? I wouldn't dare. I've got to, said Diggory. It's about Mother. If anyone could give me something that would do her good, it would be him. I'll come along with you, said the cabbie. I like the looks of him, and I don't reckon these other beasts will go for us, and I want a word with old Strawberry. So all three of them stepped out boldly, or as boldly as they could, towards the assembly of animals. The creatures were so busy talking to one another and making friends that they didn't notice the three humans until they were very close. Nor did they hear Uncle Andrew, who was standing trembling in his button boots a good way off and shouting, but by no means at the top of his voice, Diggory, come back, come back at once when you're told. I forbid you to go a step further. When at last they were right in among the animals, the animals all stopped talking and stared at them. Well, said the he-beaver at least, what in the name of Aslan are these? Please, began Diggory in rather a breathless voice, when the rabbit had said, They're a kind of large lettuce. That's my belief. No, we're not. Honestly, we're not, said Polly hastily. We're not at all nice to eat. There, said the mole. They can talk. Who ever heard of talking lettuce? Perhaps they're the second joke, suggested the jackdaw. A panther, which had been washing its face, stopped for a moment to say, Well, if they are, they're nothing like so good as the first one. At least I don't see anything very funny about them. It yawned and went on with its wash. Oh, please, said Diggory, I'm in such a hurry. I want to see the lion. All this time, the cabbie had been trying to catch Strawberry's eye. Now he did. Now, Strawberry, old boy, he said, you know me. You ain't going to stand there and say as you don't know me. What's the thing talking about, horse? said several voices. Well, said Strawberry very slowly, I don't exactly know. I think most of us don't know much about anything yet. But I've a sort of idea I've been talking a thing like this before. I have a feeling I live somewhere else, or was something else, before Aslan woke us all up a few minutes ago. It's all very muddled, like a dream. But there were things like these three in the dream. <laughs> what, said the cabbie, not know me? Me what used to bring you a hot mash of an evening when you was out of sorts? Me what rubbed you down proper? Me what never forgot to put your cloth on if you were standing in the cold? I wouldn't have thought it of you, Strawberry. It, it does begin to come back said the horse thoughtfully. Yes, let me think now, let me think. Yes, you used to tie a horrid black thing behind me and then hit me to make me run, and however far I ran, this black thing would always be coming rattle, rattle behind me. We had our living to earn, see, said the cabbie. Yours the same as mine, and if there hadn't been no work and no whip, there'd have been no stable, no hay, no mash, and no oats. For you did get a taste of oats when I could afford them, which no one can deny. Oats, said the horse, pricking up his ears. Yes, I remember something about that. Yes, I remember more and more. You were always sitting up somewhere behind, and I was always running in front, pulling you in the black thing. I know I did all the work. Summer, I grant you, said the cabbie. Art work for you, and a cool seat for me. But what about winter, old boy, when you was keeping yourself warm, and I was sitting up there with my feet like ice, and my nose fair pinched off with me in the wind, and my arms that numb I couldn't hardly hold the reins? It was a hard, cruel country, said Strawberry. There was no grass, all hard stones. Too true, mate, too true, said the cabbie. A hard world it was. I always did say those paving stones weren't fair on any horse. That's London it is. I didn't like it no more than what you did. You were a country oss, and I was a country man. Used to sing in the choir I did, down at home. But there wasn't a living for me there. Oh, please, please, said Diggory. Could we get on? The lion's getting further and further away, and I do want to speak to him so dreadfully badly. Look here, Strawberry, said the cabbie. This young gentleman has something on his mind that he wants to talk to the lion about. Him you call Aslan. Suppose you was to let him ride on your back. 
which he'd take it very kindly, and trot him over to where the lion is. And me and the little girl will be following along. Ride, said Strawberry. Oh, I remember now. That means sitting on my back. I remember there used to be a little one of you two-leggers used to do that long ago. He used to have little hard square lumps of some white stuff that he gave me. They tasted, oh, wonderful, sweeter than grass. Ah, that would be sugar, said the cabby. Please, Strawberry, begged Diggory, do, do let me get up and take me to Aslan. Well, I don't mind, said the horse. Not for once in a way. Up you get. Good old Strawberry, said the cabby. Here, young'un, I'll give you a lift. Diggory was soon on Strawberry's back, and quite comfortable, for he had ridden bareback before on his own pony. Now, do gee up, Strawberry, he said. You don't happen to have a bit of that white stuff about you, I suppose, said the horse. No, I'm afraid I haven't, said Diggory. Well, it can't be helped, said Strawberry, and off they went. At that moment, a large bulldog, who had been sniffing and staring very hard, said, Look, isn't there another of these queer creatures over there beside the river under the trees? Then all the animals looked and saw Uncle Andrew standing very still among the rhododendrons and hoping he wouldn't be noticed. Come on, said several voices, let's go and find out. So while Strawberry was briskly trotting away with Diggory in one direction, and Polly and the cabby were following on foot, most of the creatures rushed towards Uncle Andrew with roars, barks, grunts, and various noises of cheerful interest. We must now go back a bit and explain what the whole scene had looked like from Uncle Andrew's point of view. It has not made at all the same impression on him as on the cabby and the children. For what you see and hear depends a good deal on where you are standing. It also depends on what sort of person you are. Ever since the animals had first appeared, Uncle Andrew had been shrinking further and further back into the thicket. He watched them very hard, of course, but he wasn't really interested in seeing what they were doing, only in seeing whether they were going to make a rush at him. Like the witch, he was dreadfully practical. He simply didn't notice that Aslan was choosing one pair out of every kind of beasts. All he saw, or thought he saw, was a lot of dangerous wild animals walking vaguely about. And he kept on wondering why the anima animals didn't run away from the big lion. When the great moment came and the beasts spoke, he missed the whole point, for a rather interesting reason. When the lion had first begun singing long ago, when it was still quite dark, he had realized that the noise was a song, and he had disliked the song very much. It made him think and feel things he did not want to think and feel. Then, when the sun rose and he saw that the singer was a lion, only a lion, he said to himself, he tried his hardest to make himself believe that it wasn't singing and never had been singing, only roaring as any lion might in a zoo in our own world. Of course, it really have, couldn't have been singing, he thought. I must have imagined it. I've been letting my nerves get out of order. Who ever heard of a lion singing? And the longer and more beautifully the lion sang, the harder Uncle Andrew tried to make himself believe that he could hear nothing but roaring. Now, the trouble about trying to make yourself stupider than you really are is that you very often succeed. Uncle Andrew did. He soon did hear nothing but roaring in Aslan's song. Soon he couldn't have heard anything else, even if he had wanted to. And when at last the lion spoke and said, Narnia, awake, he didn't hear any words. He heard only a snarl. And when the beast spoke in answer, he heard only barkings, growlings, bangs, and howlings. And when they laughed, well, you can imagine, that was worse for Uncle Andrew than anything that had happened yet. Such a horrid, bloodthirsty din of hungry and angry brutes he had never heard in all of his life. Then, to his utter rage and horror, he saw the other three humans actually walking out into the open to meet the animals. The fools, he said to himself. Now those brutes will eat the rings along with the children, and I'll never be able to get home again. What a selfish little boy that Diggory is, and the others are just as bad. If they want to throw away their own lives, that's their business. But what about me? They don't seem to think of that. No one thinks of me. Finally, when the whole crowd of animals came rushing towards him, he turned and ran for his life. And now anyone could see that the air of that young world was really doing the old gentleman good. 
In London, he had been far too old to run. Now he ran at a speed which would have made him certain to win the hundred yards race at any prep school in England. His coattails flying out behind him were a fine sight. But of course, it was no use. Many of the animals behind him were swift ones. It was the first run they had ever taken in their lives, and they were all longing to use their new muscles. After him, after him, they shouted. Perhaps he's that Neville. Tally-ho, time to me. Cut him off, round him up, keep it up, hooray. In a few minutes, some of them got ahead of him. They lined up in a row and barred his way. Others hemmed him in from behind. Wherever he looked, he saw terrors. Antlers of great elks and the huge face of an elephant towered over him. Heavy, serious-minded bears and boars grunted behind him. Cool-looking leopards and panthers with sarcastic faces, as he thought, stared at him and waved their tails. What struck him most of all was the number of open mouths. The animals had really opened their mouths to pant. He thought they had opened their mouths to eat him. Uncle Andrew stood trembling and swaying this way and that. He had never liked animals at the best of times, being usually rather afraid of them. And, of course, years of doing cruel experiments on animals had made him hate and fear them far more. "'Now, sir,' said the bulldog in his business-like way, "'are you animal, vegetable, or mineral?' That was what it really said, but all Uncle Andrew heard was, Grrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrrr
And yet, you know, said the elephant, the she-elephant, of course, her husband, as you remember, had been called away by Aslan. And yet, you know, it might be an animal of some kind. Mightn't the whitish lump at this end be a sort of face? And couldn't those holes be eyes and a mouth? No nose, of course. But then, <clears throat> you one mustn't be narrow-minded. Very few of us have what could exactly be called a nose. She squinted down the length of her own trunk with pardonable pride. I object to that remark very strongly, said the bulldog. The elephant is quite right, said the tapir. I tell you what, said the donkey. Perhaps it's an animal that can't talk, but thinks it can. Can it be made to stand up, said the elephant thoughtfully. She took the limp form of Uncle Andrew gently in her trunk and set him up on one end. Upside down, unfortunately, so that two half-sovereigns, three half-crowns, and a sixpence fell out of his pocket. But it was of no use. Uncle Andrew merely collapsed again. There, said several voices, it isn't an animal at all. It's not alive. I tell you, it is an animal, said the bulldog. Smell it for yourself. Smelling isn't everything, said the elephant. Why, said the bulldog, if a fellow can't trust his nose, what is he to trust? Well, his brains, perhaps, she replied mildly. I object to that remark very strongly, said the bulldog. Well, we must do something about it, said the elephant, because it may be the nevil, and it must be shown to Aslan. What do most of us think? Is it an animal or something of the tree kind? Tree, tree, said a dozen voices. Very well, said the elephant. Then if it's a tree, it wants to be planted. We must dig a hole. The two moles settled that part of the business pretty quickly. There was some dispute as to which way up Uncle Andrew ought to be put into the hole, and he had a very narrow escape from being put in head first. Several animals said his legs must be his branches, and therefore the gray fluffy thing, they meant his head, must be his root. But then others said that the forked end of him was the muddier and that it spread out more, as roots ought to do. So finally he was planted right way up. When they had patted down the earth, it came up above his knees. It looks dreadfully withered, said the donkey. Of course, it wants some watering, said Elephant. I think I might say, meaning no offense to anyone present, that perhaps for that sort of work, my kind of nose. I object to that remark very strongly, said the bulldog. But the elephant walked quietly to the river, filled her trunk with water, and came back to attend to Uncle Andrew. The sagacious animal went on doing this till gallons of water had been squirted over him, and water was running out of the skirts of his frock coat as if he had been for a bath with all of his clothes on. In the end, it revived him. He awoke from his faint. What awakening it was! But we must leave him to think over his wicked deeds, if he was likely to do anything so sensible and turn to more important things. Strawberry trotted on with Diggory on his back till the noise of the other animals died away. And now the little group of Aslan and his chosen counselors was quite close. Diggory knew that he couldn't possibly break in on so solemn a meeting, but there was no need to do so. At a word from Aslan, the he-elephant, the ravens, and all the rest of them drew aside. Diggory slipped off the horse and found himself face to face with Aslan. And Aslan was bigger, and more beautiful, and more brightly golden, and more terrible than he had thought. He dared not look into the great eyes. P please, Mr. Lion, Aslan, sir, said Diggory, could you, m may I, please, will you give me some magic fruit of this country to make mother well? He had been desperately hoping that the lion would say yes. He had been horribly afraid it might say no, but he was taken aback when it did neither. This is the boy, said Aslan, looking not at Diggory, but at his counselors. This is the boy who did it. Oh dear, thought Diggory, what have I done now? Son of Adam, said the lion, there is an evil witch abroad in my new land of Narnia. Tell these good beasts how she came here. A dozen different things that he might say flashed through Diggory's mind, but he had the sense to say nothing except the exact truth. I brought her, Aslan, he answered in a low voice. For what purpose? 
I wanted to get her out of my own world, back into her own. I thought I was taking her back to her own place. How came she to be in your world, son of Adam? By... by magic. The lion said nothing, and Diggory knew that he had not told enough. It was my uncle, Aslan, he said. He sent us out of our own world by magic rings. At least I had to go because he sent Polly first. And then when we met the witch in a place called Charn, and she just held on to us when... You met the witch, said Aslan in a low voice, which had the threat of a growl in it. She woke up, said Diggory wretchedly, and then turning very white. I mean, I woke her because I wanted to know what would happen if I struck a bell. Polly didn't want to. It wasn't her fault. I, I fought her. I know I shouldn't have. I think I was a bit enchanted by the writing under the bell. Do you? asked Aslan, still speaking very low and deep. No, said Diggory. I see now I wasn't. I was only pretending. There was a long pause, and Diggory was thinking all the time, I've spoiled everything. There's no chance of getting anything from Mother now. When the lion spoke again, it was not to Diggory. You see, friends, he said, that before the new clean world I gave you is seven hours old, a force of evil has already entered it, waked and brought hither by this son of Adam. The beasts, even Strawberry, all turned their eyes on Diggory till he felt that he wished the ground would swallow him up. But do not be cast down said Aslan, still speaking to the beasts. Evil will come of that evil, but it is still a long way off, and I will see to it that the worst falls upon myself. In the meantime, let us take such order that for many hundred years, yet this shall be a merry land in a merry world. And as Adam's race has done the harm, Adam's race shall help to heal it. Draw near, you other two. The last words were spoken to Polly and the cabbie, who had now arrived. Polly, all eyes and mouth, was staring at Aslan and holding the cabbie's hand rather tightly. The cabbie gave one glance at the lion, took off his bowler hat. No one had yet seen him without it. When it was off, he looked younger and nicer, and more like the countryman and less like a London cabman. Son, said Aslan to the cabbie, I have known you long. Do you know me? "'Well, no, sir,' said the cabbie, "'leastways not in any ordinary manner of speaking. "'Yet I feel somehow, if I may make so free "'as how we've met before.' "'It is well,' said the lion. "'You know better than you think you know, "'and you shall live to know me better yet. "'How does this land please you?' "'It's a fair treat, sir,' said cabbie. "'Would you like to live here always?' Well, you see, sir, I'm a married man, said the cabbie. If my wife was here, neither of us would ever want to go back to London, I reckon. We are both country folks, really. Aslan threw, his sh uh, threw up his shaggy head, opened his mouth, and uttered a long single note, not very loud, but full of power. Polly's heart jumped in her body when she heard it. She felt sure that it was a call, and that anyone who heard that call would want to obey it, and, what's more, would be able to obey it, however many worlds and ages lay between. And so, though she was filled with wonder, she was not really astonished or shocked when all of a sudden a young woman with a kind, honest face stepped out of nowhere and stood beside her. Polly knew at once that it was the cabbie's wife, fetched out of our world not by any tiresome magic rings, but quickly, simply, and sweetly, as a bird flies to its nest. The young woman had apparently been in the middle of a washing day, for she wore an apron, her sleeves were rolled up to the elbow, and there were soap suds on her hands. If she had had time to put on her good clothes, her best hat and imitation cherries on it, she would have looked dreadful. As it was, she looked rather nice. Of course, she thought she was dreaming. That was why she didn't rush across to her husband and ask him what on earth had happened to them both. But when she looked at the lion, she didn't feel quite so sure it was a dream. Yet for some reason, she did not appear to be very frightened. Then she dropped a little half curtsy, as some, country's gir some country girls still knew how to do in those days. After that, she went and put her hand in the cabbies and stood there looking round her a little shyly. My children 
said Aslan, fixing his eyes on both of them. You are to be the first king and queen of Narnia. The cabbie opened his mouth in astonishment, and his wife turned very red. You shall rule and name all these creatures, and do justice among them, and protect them from their enemies when enemies arise. And enemies will arise, for there is an evil witch in this world. The cabbie swallowed hard two or three times and cleared his throat. <clears throat> Begging your pardon, sir, he said, and thanking you very much, I'm sure, which my missus does the same, but I ain't no sort of chap for a job like that. I never had much education, you see. Well, said Aslan, can you use a spade and a plow and raise food out of the earth? Yes, sir, I could do a bit of that sort of work, being brought up to it like. Can you rule these creatures kindly and fairly, remembering that they are not slaves like the dumb beasts of the world you were born in, but talking beasts and free subjects? I see that, sir, replied the cabby. I try to do the square thing by them all. And would you bring up your children and grandchildren to do the same? It'd be to me to try, sir. I'd do my best, wouldn't we, Nelly? And you wouldn't have favorites either among your own children or among the other creatures, or let any hold on other yonder or use it hardly? I never could abide such goings on, sir, and that's the truth. I'd give him what for if I caught him at it, said the cabby. All through this conversation, his voice was growing slower and richer, more like the country voice he must have had as a boy, and less like the sharp, quick voice of a cockney. And if enemies came against the land, for enemies will arise, and there was war, would you be the first in the charge and the last in the retreat? Well, sir, said the cabby very slowly, a chap don't exactly know till he's been tried. I dare say I might turn out ever such a soften. Never did no fighting except with my fists. I'd try, that is, I hope I'd try, to do my bit. Then, said Aslan, you will have done all that a king should do. Your coronation will be held presently, and you and your children and grandchildren shall be blessed, and some will be kings of Narnia, and others will be kings of Archenland, which lies yonder over the southern mountains. And you, little daughter, here he turned to Polly, are welcome. Have you forgiven the boy for the violence he did you in the Hall of Images, in the desolate palace of accursed Charn? Yes, Aslan, we've made it up, said Polly. That is well, said Aslan. And now for the boy himself. And that is the end of that chapter. Another quick drink. Wow, <clears throat> to finally um, hear Aslan speak and to um, see that his message is good uh, is an amazing feeling, uh, especially reading it. So I hope you're enjoying uh, the book as much as I am. Okay, final chapter for today. <clears throat> chapter 12, Strawberry's Adventure. Diggory kept his mouth very tight shut. He had been growing more and more uncomfortable. He hoped that whatever happened, he wouldn't blub or do anything ridiculous. Excuse me. <coughs> Son of Adam, said Aslan, are you ready to undo the wrong that you have done to my sweet country of Narnia on the very day of its birth? Well, I don't see what I can do, said Diggory. You see, the queen ran away and... I asked, are you ready? said the lion. Yes, said Diggory. He had had for a second some wild idea of saying, I'll try to help you if you'll promise to help about my mother. But he realized in time that the lion was not at all the sort of person one could try to make bargains with. But when he had said yes, he thought of his mother, and he thought of the great hopes he had had, and how they were all dying away, and a lump came in his throat and tears in his eyes, and he blurted out, But please, please, won't you? Can't you give me something that will cure mother? 
Up till then, he had been looking at the lion's great front feet and the huge claws on them. Now, in his despair, he looked up at its face. What he saw surprised him as much as anything in his whole life, for the tawny face was bent down near his own, and, wonder of wonders, great shining tears stood in the lion's eyes. They were such big, bright tears compared with Diggory's own that for a moment he felt as if the lion must really be sorrier about his mother than he was himself. My son, my son, said Aslan, I know. Grief is great. Only you and I in this land know that yet. Let us be good to one another. But I have to think of hundreds of years in the life of Narnia. The witch whom you have brought into this world will come back to Narnia again. But it need not be yet. It is my wish to plant in Narnia a tree that she will not dare to approach. And that tree will protect Narnia from her for many years. So this land shall have a long, bright morning before any clouds come over the sun. You must get me the seed from which that tree is to grow. Yes, sir, said Diggory. He didn't know how it was to be done, but he felt sure now that he would be able to do it. The lion drew a deep breath, stooped its head even lower, and gave him a lion's kiss. And at once Diggory felt that new strength and courage had gone into him. Dear son, said Aslan, I will tell you what you must do. Turn and look to the west, and tell me what do you see? I see terribly big mountains, Aslan, said Diggory. I see this river coming down cliffs in a waterfall, and beyond the cliff there are high green hills with forests, and beyond those there are higher ranges that look almost black, and then far, far away there are big snowy mountains all heaped up together, like pictures of the Alps, and behind those there's nothing but the sky. You see well, said the lion. Now the land of Narnia ends where the waterfall comes down, and once you have reached the top of the cliff, you will be out of Narnia and into the western wild. You must journey through those mountains till you find a green valley with a blue lake in it, walled round by mountains of ice. At the end of the lake there is a steep green hill. On the top of that hill there is a garden. In the center of that garden is a tree. Pluck an apple from that tree and bring it back to me. Yes, sir, said Diggory again. He hadn't the least idea of how he was to climb the cliff and find his way among all the mountains, but he didn't like to say that for fear it would sound like making excuses. But he did say, I hope, Aslan, you're not in a hurry. I shan't be able to get there and back very quickly. Little son of Adam, you shall have help, said Aslan. He then turned to the horse, who had been standing quietly beside them all this time, swishing his tail to keep the flies off, and listening with his head on one side, as if the conversation were a little difficult to understand. My dear, said Aslan to the horse, would you like to become a winged horse? You should have seen how the horse shook its mane, and how its nostrils widened, and the little tappet gave the ground with one back hoof. Clearly, it would very much like to be a winged horse. But it only said, If you wish, Aslan. If you really mean, I don't know why it should be me. I'm not a very clever horse. Be winged. Be the father of all flying horses, roared Aslan in a voice that shook the ground. Your name is Fledge. The horse shied, just as it might have shied in the old miserable days when it pulled a hansom. Then it reared. It strained its neck back as if there were a fly biting its shoulders and it wanted to scratch them. And then, just as the beasts had burst out of the earth, there burst out of the shoulders of Fledge wings that spread and grew, larger than eagles, larger than swans, larger than angels' wings in church windows. The feathers shone chestnut color and copper color. He gave a great sweep with them and leapt into the air. Twenty feet above Aslan and Diggory, he snorted, neighed, and curvetted. Then, after circling once round them, he dropped to the earth, all four hoofs together, looking awkward and surprised, but extremely pleased. Is it good, Fledge? said Aslan. It is very good, Aslan, said Fledge. 
Will you carry this little son of Adam on your back to the mountain valley I spoke of? What? Now? At once, said Strawberry, or Fledge, as we must now call him. Hooray! Come on, little one. I have had things like you in my back before, long, long ago, when there were green fields and sugar. <clears throat> what are the two daughters of Eve whispering about? said Aslan, turning very suddenly on Polly and the cabbie's wife, who had in fact been making friends. If you please, sir, said Queen Helen, for that is what Nellie the cabman's wife now was. I think the little girl would love to go too, if it weren't no trouble. What does Fledge say about that? asked the lion. Oh, I don't mind too, not when they're little ones, said Fledge, but I hope the elephant doesn't want to come as well. The elephant had no such wish, and the new king of Narnia helped both the children up, that is, he gave Diggory a rough heave, and set Polly as gently and daintily on the horse's back as if she were made of china and might break. There they are, Strawberry. Fledge, I should say. This is a rum go. Do not fly too high, said Aslan. Do not try to go over the tops of the great ice mountains. Look out for the valleys, the green places, and fly through them. There will always be a way through. And now, be gone with my blessing. Oh, Fledge, said Diggory, leaning forward to pat the horse's glossy neck. This is fun. Hold on to me tight, Polly. Next moment, the country dropped away beneath them and whirled round as Fledge, like a huge pigeon, circled once or twice before setting off on his long westward flight. Looking down, Polly could hardly see the king and the queen, and even Aslan himself was only a bright yellow spot on the green grass. Soon the wind was in their faces, and Fledge's wings settled down to a steady beat. All Narnia, many colored with lawns and rocks and heather and different sorts of trees, lay spread out below them, the river winding through it like a ribbon of quicksilver. They could already see over the tops of the low hills which lay northward on their right, Beyond those hills, a great moorland sloped gently up and up to the horizon. On their left, the mountains were much higher, but every now and then there was a gap where you could see, between steep pine woods, a glimpse of the southern lands that lay beyond them, looking blue and far away. That'll be where Archenland is, said Polly. Yes, but look ahead, said Diggory. For now, a great barrier of cliffs rose before them, and they were almost dazzled by the sunlight dancing on the great waterfall by which the river roars and sparkles down into Narnia itself from the high western lands in which it rises. They were flying so high already that the thunder of those falls could only just be heard as a small, thin sound, but they were not yet high enough to fly over the top of the cliffs. We'll have to do a bit of zigzagging here, said Fledge. Hold on tight. He began flying to and fro, getting higher at each turn. The air grew colder, and they heard the call of eagles far below them. I say, look back, look behind, said Polly. There they could see the whole valley of Narnia stretched out to where, just before the eastern horizon, there was the gleam of the sea. And now they were so high that they could see tiny-looking jagged mountains appearing beyond the northern moors, and plains of what looked like sand far in the south. I wish we had someone to tell us what all those places are, said Diggory. I don't suppose they're anywhere yet, said Polly. I mean, there's no one there, and nothing happening. The world only began today. No, but people will get there, said Diggory, and then they'll have histories, you know. Well... It's a jolly good thing they haven't now, said Polly, because nobody can be made to learn it. Battles and dates and all that rot. Now they were over the top of the cliffs, and in a few minutes the valley land of Narnia had sunk out of sight behind them. They were flying over a wild country of steep hills and dark forests, still following the course of the river. The really big mountains loomed ahead, but the sun was now in the travelers' eyes, and they couldn't see things very clearly in that direction. For the sun sank lower and lower, till the western sky was all like one great furnace full of melted gold, and it set at last behind a jagged peak which stood up against the brightness as sharp and flat as if it were cut out of cardboard. It's none too warm up here, said Polly. And my wings are beginning to ache, said Fledge. There's no sign of the valley with a lake in it, like what Aslan said. 
What about coming down and looking out for a decent place to spend the night in? We shan't reach that place tonight. Yes, and surely it's about time for supper, said Diggory. So Fledge came lower and lower. As they came down nearer to the earth and among the hills, the air grew warmer. And after traveling so many hours with nothing to listen to but the beat of Fledge's wings, it was nice to hear the homely and earthy noises again. The chatter of the river on its stony bed and the creaking of trees in the light wind. A warm, good smell of sun-baked earth and grass and flowers came up to greet them. At last, Fledge lighted. Diggory rolled off and helped Polly to dismount. Both were glad to stretch their stiff legs. The valley in which they had come down was in the heart of the mountains, snowy heights. One of them, looking rose-red in the reflection of the sunset, towered above them. I am hungry, said Diggory. Well, tuck in, said Fledge, taking a big mouthful of grass. Then he raised his head, still chewing, and with bits of grass sticking out on each side of his mouth like whiskers, said... Come on, you two. Don't be shy. There's plenty for us all. But we can't eat grass, said Diggory. <clears throat> said Fledge, speaking with his mouth full. Well, I don't know quite what you'll do then. Very good grass, too. Polly and Diggory stared at one another in dismay. Well, I do think someone might have arranged about our meals, said Diggory. I'm sure Aslan would have if you'd asked him, said Fledge. Wouldn't he know about without being asked, said Polly. I've no doubt that he would, said the horse, still with his mouth full. But I have a sort of idea he likes to be asked. But what on earth are we to do, asked Diggory. I'm sure you, I don't know, said Fledge. Unless you try the grass, you might like it better than you think. Oh, don't be silly, said Polly, stamping her foot. Of course humans can't eat grass, any more than you could eat a mutton chop. For goodness sake, don't talk about chops and things, said Diggory. It only makes it worse. Diggory said that Polly had better take herself home by ring and get something to eat there. He couldn't himself because he had promised to go straight on his message for Aslan. And if once he showed up again at home, anything might happen to prevent his coming back. But Polly said she wouldn't leave him, and Diggory said it was jolly decent of her. I say, said Polly, I've still got the remains of that bag of toffee in my pocket. It'll be better than nothing. A lot better, said Diggory, but be careful to get your hand into your pocket without touching your ring. This was a difficult and delicate job, but they managed it in the end. The little paper bag was very squashy and sticky when they finally got it out, so that it was more a question of tearing the bag off the toffees than of getting the toffees out of the bag. Some grown-ups, you know, how fussy they can be about that sort of thing, would rather have gone without supper altogether than eating those toffees. There were nine of them all told. It was Diggory who had the bright idea of eating four each, and planting the ninth, for, as he said, if the bar off the lamppost turned into a little light tree, why shouldn't this turn into a toffee tree? So they doubled a small hole in the turf and buried the piece of toffee. Then they ate the other pieces, making them last as long as they could. It was a poor meal. Even with all the paper, they couldn't help eating as well. When Fledge had quite finished his own excellent supper of he lay down, the children came and sat one on each side of him, leaning against his warm body, and when he had spread a wing over each, they were really quite snug. As the bright young stars of that new world came out, they talked over everything, how Diggory had hoped to get something for his mother, and how, instead of that, he had been sent on this message. And they repeated to one another all the signs by which they would know the place they were looking for, the blue lake and the hill with the garden on top of it. The talk was just beginning to slow down as they got sleepy, when suddenly Polly sat up wide awake and said, Hush! Everyone listened as hard as they could. Perhaps it was only the wind in the trees, said Diggory presently. I'm not so sure, said Fledge. Anyway, wait! There it goes again. By Aslan, it is something. The horse scrambled to its feet with a great noise and a great upheaval. The children were already on theirs. Fledge trotted to and fro, sniffing and whinnying. 
The children tiptoed this way and that, looking behind every bush and tree. They kept on thinking they saw things, and there was one time when Polly was perfectly certain she had seen a tall, dark figure gliding quickly away in a westerly direction. But they caught nothing, and in the end Fledge lay down again, and the children re-snuggled, if that is the right word, under his wings. They went to sleep at once. Fledge stayed awake much longer, moving his ears to and fro in the darkness, and sometimes giving a little shiver with his skin as if a fly had lighted on him. But in the end, he too slept. And that is the end of the chapter. Wow. Such descriptions, right? As uh, Mr. Lewis is describing the world of Narnia from the children's point of view. Wow. Such an amazing place. And it all sprang up within a day, simply by Aslan's song. Amazing. Well, I am going to finish reading this book, chapters 13, 14, 15, on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m., live right here on Facebook, and I will upload everything onto my YouTube channel, and you can search for me on YouTube using my name, Chris Stalke, that's S-T-A-H-L-K-E, and I hope you enjoyed the reading, and I hope you'll join me for the finale of The Magician's Nephew, by C.S. Lewis on Wednesday evening at 7 p.m. Until then, this has been Storytime with Chris. Bye-bye.